Hi everyone and welcome to BSN 380 Healthcare Policy in the Nursing Professional Week 1. I'm going to try and do um, a video like this at the beginning of every week in the announcements that will feature the student competencies and a bit about the discussion and um, assignments and then following up with some of the important concepts from the week. I do um, welcome any questions that you have though, even after you've watched the video. If you still have more questions, please email me through our BayPath email. I normally check my emails twice a day during um, sessions, so feel free to do that. So when we're going to be talking about nursing policy during this session, we are talking about legislative policy and legislative process. We're not talking about policies that may happen um, in hospitals, like a policy on um, fall risk or, or something like that. We are talking about broad um, legislative policies. So to use our power and influence effectively, we need to develop an awareness of the legislative process and hone our working knowledge of the political arena. Nurses have been somewhat reluctant to do this in the past. We have, for the most part, just wanted to take care of our patients with no time or interest in the politics of individual institutions and even less interest in the political activities going on around us. We may feel that we're ill-equipped to delve into legislative activities, but... I ask you, who better to advocate for patients than nurses? We've been patient advocates in our interactions with doctors and administrators. Why not with Congress? I think that this session is going to be particularly interesting because of what's going on um, with this unprecedented COVID-19 um, pandemic and all of the governmental um, and state um, influences that are involved in that, and also because we are coming up to a presidential election. Much of that has been, uh, you know, put to the wayside in the news because of this pandemic, but it is still going to happen in November. I do also want to advise you um, during your the course of this session to go to the American Nurses Association website. They have a whole um, area on um, policy and policy making that you will probably find very helpful. So our week one student competencies are to explore the relationship between nursing and healthcare policy, discuss a nursing leader's contribution to initiate healthcare policy, describe the present government sponsored healthcare plan, which is the ACA, um, which was enacted to provide patient-centered care related to preferences, culture, and abilities of individuals and families, and then evaluate the ACA. Um, I have this picture up here just to remind us that the World Health Organization has declared 2020 as the International Year of the Nurse. This is to mark the bicentenary of the birth of the founder of modern nursing, Florence Nightingale, and to recognize her critical contributions to the nursing profession and to global health. So our discussion this week, um, speaking of Florence Nightingale, is that there were many nurses who were involved in working with the government to initiate change in public health. Explore the relationship between nursing and healthcare policy and then choose a nurse leader who is a pioneer in healthcare and discuss her role in healthcare policy. Our paper is to look at the ACA, um, and describe and evaluate uh, that plan, including the provision of patient-centered care, and share a specific piece of that policy that you're aware of and describe its impact on patient-centered care. Just some influential nurses that come to mind when um, I was thinking about this assignment was, of course, Florence Nightingale. She was uh, the founder and she came up with many of our nursing interventions that we use today from hand washing to the importance of patients getting fresh air. 
um, Dorothea Dix, who re revolutionized care for the mentally ill, and Florence Wald, who improved the care of the dying patient. Um, she's also known as the mother of hospice. Just a little bit about each one of them there. So the Affordable Care Act and the Health Care and Education Reconcili Act, Reconciliation Act of 2010 is still active. When the current president came into office, he did try to replace it, but it was never officially signed by um, both um, legislative bodies and it never made it to his desk. So besides the Affordable Care Act, we can also think of other governmental programs, and these are for different or special populations, which would be Medicare for the disabled and the elderly, Medicaid um, for um, low-income uh, people, the um, Children's Health Insurance Program, which would be for children, and then the TRICARE programs, which are for um, Department of Defense and the, and the Veterans and the Indian Health Services. So the IOM defines uh, patient-centered care as providing care that's respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs and values, and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions. The Affordable Care Act repeatedly refers to patient-centered care, uh, patient satisfaction, patient experience of care, patient engagement, and shared decision making in its provisions. We're going to talk a lot about those things um, this session, and I know that it's come up, and no matter where you guys are working, um, the whole idea of patient experience has come up. We're also going to talk about um, the more general term, quality measures, um, these certain patient-centered assessments that are required, um, like Medicare's value-based purchasing program. Um, patient-centered care also highlights um, communication, um, involving patients more closely in their care, um, getting them to adhere to their um, advice, and should hopefully lead to um, improvement in patient health. So the concept of patient care has been around for a long time. Um, it wasn't until the ACA placed financial incentives on it that the concept um, really began to take notice. And when I say that, I mean things like, and again, I think no matter what um, area of healthcare you work in, you're familiar with value-based purchasing, um, patient experience, um, uh, readmission rates, um, and um, things like um, um, myocardial infarctions, heart failure, pneumonia, core measures. So lastly, I just want to reiterate that care that is truly patient-centered considers the patient's cultural traditions, their personal preferences, their family situations, and their lifestyles, makes the patient and their loved ones an integral part of the care team. And we're going to have a couple of different um, scenario type assignments where we're going to look at different types of families. Um, when the patient, when the care is patient-centered, unneeded and unwanted services can be reduced. So a healthcare system that's truly patient-centered may provide higher quality healthcare with greater efficiency while improving the patient experience. Um, so again, uh, I hope that you enjoy this session. Please feel free to ask me any questions and hopefully we will talk about our current situations of our pandemic and our current um, election um, and how it works with all of the stuff that we're going to be talking about this session. So I'll see you guys online.